before we get into the very first episode, I thought it would be appropriate to officially introduce myself, the series, and why I'm creating this content. I believe the desire for love is universal, but at 30, I find myself resisting this desire out of fear, anxiety, and doubt. If there's one thing I'm really good at besides talking to people, it's ruminating and catastrophizing. And it's hard to be open to the possibilities of love when your mind is constantly preoccupied by the worst case scenario. At 30, it feels like my mind and my heart are in two different places, and I'm hoping these conversations can help bring me back to alignment. My first guest in this series is a friend named Zelik. I met Zelik in a rideshare to a Vipassana meditation retreat last November. Being my curious self, I had a few questions for Zelik and many more when I learned about his marriage and his journey into marriage. I wanted to learn more about his fears, resistance, and hesitation, and I wanted to know how he overcame them. At some point in our conversation, he mentioned that he was thinking of doing a Q&A at a local synagogue on dating and marriage with the youth. As soon as I heard him say this, a voice in my head was like, Arash, this is the guy. You found your first interviewee. Coincidentally, I had been thinking about creating an interview series talking to people about love and dating, and something was telling me that I had just found my first guest. I pitched the idea to Zelik and asked if he'd be comfortable doing a video interview, and he said yes. The following conversation between Zelik and I is one that touches many subjects, including love, marriage, inner child work, trauma, and the development of self-knowledge. Enjoy. I didn't get married until I was 48. Uh, I'd never really had that many girlfriends. I wasn't that connected. And my sense of it is that I was certainly, I, I didn't, when I looked around, I didn't see any reason <laughs> that I found um, relationships and love attractive. To me, love meant constraint, strangulation, uh, loss of autonomy and this was my experience as a kid growing up where and it took me a long time to figure out what I perceived as control my mother was exercising protection but I didn't see this I only saw it as constraint so number one that was my first place of love I didn't see examples of happy marriages I didn't see examples of happy love so why would I get involved in something that didn't have a payback for me. And except that, I became lonely. And when I was about 40-ish, I decided um, I have to stop spinning my wheels and find out I'm not getting what I want. Anyways, part of that process was learning about love. I've come to the conclusion that love is a condition. And for me, Love is a condition where I get to be all of who I am in the company of another. And vice versa, that somebody else who is in a loving relationship with me, that person also gets to be all of who that person is in my company. And the separation of self, that is the person, from the deed, the actions. I don't have to be comfortable with everything that somebody does, but um, but the loving, a loving condition for me means they are, they can be who they are. I don't have to like what they do. And, the, and that, the part that has to get worked out. What did the work look like in overcoming that fear of the, the loss of autonomy uh, and perhaps uh, selfness? Okay, my second favorite topic on par with my first favorite topic. I think the answer to everything. <laughs> so yeah is inner child work, your inner child. Everything I learned about life, I probably learned in my first 12 years at home. And then I spent my next lifetime trying to figure out what, what part of that I learned serves me and what part undermines me. And my, I, I, I came to the conclusion that I was born without fear. I, 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 I I came to the conclusion, I had an experience where my belief is I came into the world and I was born and I came in, I was swaddled perfectly at peace and then learned fear along the way, learned to be afraid about certain things, pain or, or people um, along the way. Uh, it was liberating to know that I wasn't afraid. 
The other thing that was liberating was meeting up with my worst case scenario. And in my case, uh, because of the work that I did, I imagined myself to be in a bottomless pit, falling, using breath to, to connect with my emotions, my fear. And the breath would continue to bring on the fear and I would continue to fall. And the fear was I was going to disintegrate. I get to the bottom. I finally, I fall, I fall, and I stop. And I'm on the bottom. And I start to giggle. Because my worst case scenario that I would disintegrate didn't happen. And that said to me, if my worst case scenario didn't happen, that is disintegration, I don't have to be afraid of anything. I don't have to be afraid of women. I don't have to be afraid of strangulation or constraint or anything like that. And that went a long way to liberating me from my fear. Um, but it didn't address other elements of anxiety for me. And about a month ago, I, I experienced anxiety. Out of the, it seemed like out of nowhere, but it was triggered by something. And I decided I was going to go into my little boy and find out what was going on. And I've learned to do that over the years. And it came out that I, w I had the conclusion my anxiety is coming from a belief that I held that I'm responsible for the well-being of the people around me and the well-being of the people I care about. Um, specifically my, my wife, and I'm responsible for her well-being. Her well-being is a very important need that I have that can only be met by her being well. And my responsibility was to ensure that she was well. Well, an impossible job for various reasons. When I changed this concept, when I said I am not, I don't hold myself responsible, however, I want to contribute to her well-being. All my anxiety left, all my panic left. I just, yes, that's true. I can contribute without cost. And I, I'm inclined to think that, I think that was the last of my anxiety. So I'm looking forward to the next six months to find out if I've um, learned. I don't have to hold on to that limiting belief. I can contribute, I don't have to be responsible. At what point in your 40s did you know that your now wife was who you wanted to marry? Uh, well, that was in my 50s. All right, you know, leading up to my 40s. I married when I was 48, so the year before, the year when I met her, um, I think what happened, she reflected my values, many of my values, um, compassion intelligence. I, she likes to talk. So we, we spend a lot of time talking about what's going on between us. When my stepdaughter got married, my other stepdaughter and my wife and I shared a kind of a, a bachelor's. And we're in bed and my stepdaughter's sleeping at the foot of the bed. Three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, she wakes up and she says, don't you guys ever stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, and we don't. We we've just from day one we talk. Yeah. So um, I like that. She likes that. We've had to learn along the way. I've had to learn my stuff. She's learning her stuff. I'm still learning my stuff. Um, so it was uh, understanding what was important to me. Once I stopped being afraid, then I could look for what was important to me what was within me and look for it in others. Um, and we're quite different. And sometimes it's difficult to get to what I need and what she needs. Win-win, which is not win-win, which is what you need, what I need, is the way I would look at win-win from another teacher that I received that from. Um, and But you can learn that, just like you can learn how to speak a language. Would you say ultimately that it was fear that kept you 
on the romantic sidelines. Absolutely. I think fear was the, the biggest, yeah, handicap to finding love. And also not knowing what love is. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, I had no idea what love is. Once you were able to express your need or desire for love, was it then easy to then convince yourself that you were capable of giving and receiving? I never thought about giving and receiving love. Hmm. It's not an action. Love, as I'm saying, I think love is a condition. Being, uh, it, love, love is, and it comes out in different ways. So it's whether I'm, fear shuts down elements of myself. My fear shuts down elements of who I am. Lose the fear, more of me comes out. And when I was 19, 20, when I was 20, working as a summer camp counselor, the camp nurse was the mother of a, another counselor, a friend of mine, and one day she intercepts me walking across the grounds. She comes up to me and she's about four foot five, seven. She comes up and she goes like this. She says, you know, this shell that you have around you, Zalik, it's very good because it keeps you safe from being hurt from outside, but it doesn't allow what's inside to come out. I had no idea what she was 19, talking about. That's a lot to take in. No, I, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. And, uh, but it was interesting. Like, obviously it was interesting because I've never forgotten it. So, and then I probably went on looking for myself in various different ways. And, but I, I really didn't understand it until many, many, many years later. Wow. Which is why it's so much fun getting old. I think something I struggle with is what am I supposed to be feeling on a first date? And in the absence of those feelings, is that a sign that there should be a second date? And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think, okay. You know, I didn't date all that much. Yeah. And then, um, I would, I would, God willing, I'll never deal with that situation again. <laughs> um, if I was going, if I was going out on dates now, or if I was giving dating advice, I'd say, connect to who you are, who you really are. And if you don't know who you are, if that's a question, then find your teachers. Before dating. No, no, it doesn't matter. Whenever you're get interested, you can, if you want to, if you want, get it, first of all, find a teacher for anything. Get yourself a teacher, acquire a companion. That's written in wisdom literature. So, and the learning that I've received is connect with myself and come from my heart. Uh, and open to hearing somebody else's heart, what's in their heart. There is no have to's or should's. There are no should's. There is no single should. There are things that serve, things that don't serve. But no should's. You don't have to feel anything. Um, if I was going out on a date, I would, uh, I would talk about things that interest me or find out about things that interest the other and and stay away from and stay away from feelings because it goes like it's out of your control <laughs> your feelings are out of your control really if you get what you like you'll feel good you'll have feelings that you like if you're not getting what you want you won't have those pleasant feelings you'll have either neutral feelings or unpleasant feelings at which point that tells you you know what I, I, th I sorry, I, I got to go home now, because, um, or, then you say, well, that was fun. Can we do this tomorrow? That's what. That's. It's a, 
It's about what your feelings tell you, not what you should have, or it's what comes up. So it sounds like it's finding yourself in a relationship where you can be yourself and move closer yeah. to who and what you it, are. That's a telltale yeah. sign. Yeah, but you know, the hardest thing in that, what you just said about find yourself a relationship so that you can be who you are. It's much easier finding a relationship than it is knowing who you are. Mm. Right? So that combination of Greek philosophy and Shakespeare said, know thyself and to your own self be true. So I asked my, I asked the, my first teacher, a psychiatrist, said, you know, I know this statement, know yourself, be your own self be true. How do you, help, how do you know yourself? He said, okay, here's what you do. You pretend you're sitting on your porch outside your house or someplace and people are walking by you who know you and you ask and this is a child take yourself back to as far as young as you can what elements what qualities what kernels of self qualities make up that child and um and that's who you are so for example Arash, do you mind my asking you absolutely okay so Take yourself back to as young as you can go. Yeah. That you remember. How old would you be? Two, three. All right. Maybe a little bit older. older so yeah. like five, five, six, six seven. Yeah. Something where you get a sense of self. Yeah. And there you are sitting outside and people that you know are passing by you. What words would they use to describe you? Sensitive. Okay. Um... Compassionate. Yeah. Uh, empathetic. Okay. But I, there was also, uh, ever since I can remember, anxiousness. Okay, an anxious child. Okay. Yeah. Right. What about uh, healthy? Healthy, yes. Right. Smart? Smart. Um, playful. Playful, right. So this is who, those are the kernels of self that you have. This is what you take into any relationship. This is what you're doing with me today, right now, here. You're taking that. You've left, for whatever reason, the anxiety is not with you. Maybe it was there on your way coming down, I don't know, but it's not there. Yeah. The good thing about anxiety, it's learned. Mm. I think for the most part, you can, you can get rid of that because Anxiety is an outcome of not having needs met. Safety. Anxiety is a result. You have a need for safety. We all have a need for safety. May, and Gabor Mate would say, fear is not rooted in the lack of safety. It's rooted in the lack of community, or it's a search for community. Anxiety is about a search for community. Mm, I don't know. I, I prefer safety myself. Um, but, you know, as our needs for safety are met, anxiety wanes. But those other elements are elements of who you are, not what you learned. Mm -hmm. um, here's an example of the difference between learning and what we are. I asked that same question to somebody. He says, I'm a, trouble, I'm a troublemaker. Okay, that, that was what, that's how he perceived himself as a troublemaker. I said, how come, uh, tell me about... What makes you a troublemaker? She says, well, uh, I would do things like I would pour gasoline on a swimming pool and then light a match. And why, did, and why did you do that? I said, well, he was curious to find out what would happen. So I'm saying, whether you're a troublemaker or not a troublemaker is really somebody's judgment. The reality is you're curious about the way of the world. And in order to be curious, you have to have intelligence. If you're not intelligent, you can't have curiosity. You just accept. So that's the difference between what is really an aspect of self and what is a judgment that is laid on by somebody else that children will take on. They take on the judgments that they hear all the time. According to your definition of love, can you fall into love or is it just how you go through the world? So I'm believing that love is a condition whereby I am who I am, free to be me in the company of another. Hmm. That is, 
I, as an individual, am accepted by the other. Not all my behaviors are accepted, and that's okay, but I am accepted. And there's, an, uh, there's the other intangible, attraction. Mm. Uh, attraction is an intangible. On the other hand, I experimented once. Yeah. I got fixed up on a date with somebody <laughs> who was nothing that I would imagine I ever wanted to be in a romantic connection with. My, I have a cousin who uh, I couldn't understand. He was always out with strong, good-looking, attractive women, intelligent. I said, how do you do this? He says, I come from my heart. Wow. Okay. So I decided I'm going to try his technique and come from my heart. It was so easy to have a relationship. I, I did, there was no judgment. Mm. Um, what was missing were those, not the intangibles, some, they were very concrete because I'm Jewish. I, I needed that connection. Um, I needed the ability, I wanted the opportunities to converse about theoretical elements or concepts, things like that. Uh, you know, it just wasn't going to be available, I didn't think. And that was important to me, so, but if I come from my heart, everybody is available. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a matter of choice. I think there's uh, an added layer of vulnerability in dating to come from your heart because then there's, in the face of rejection, underneath a mask, they don't really, they still, they haven't really rejected you, but if you're coming from your heart and, and they're not interested, they're not interested in, in you and I'm, to risk the rejection of your totality, there, is there some courage that comes alongside that? And was that easy to develop that courage or nurture it? Well, when you experience judgment yeah. or rejection, what do you feel? Hurt. You feel hurt. What, uh, and what, what is it that's missing? Because I come from the Rosenberg's teaching when we don't get what we're looking for, we have emotions that are uncomfortable. So you're hurt, I'm guessing, because you didn't get something that you value that you were looking for. What would that be? In that context, reciprocated. Yeah. Reciprocity, okay. Reciprocity. Yeah, you didn't, um, right. Now, so when you, when you didn't get reciprocity, you offered yourself mm. with full openness, revealing. You weren't vulnerable. Uh, this is, I just heard a, an Instagram tape by a, a, somebody who teaches theater. He said, I don't like the word, I don't like to use the word vulnerability because really it's not vulnerability, it's revelation. And what, I, this was the first experience I've had since this awareness came to me. But what you expressed was, you were re offering to reveal yourself. And now you were open to judgment. Actually, what you did was you handed over the opportunity and you said, here's what I am, here's who I am. Now you judge me, am I right or am I wrong in this? And then when you, when you heard the other person either not reciprocate or react, oh my gosh, you think I'm wrong. I'm, or, oh my gosh, I must be wrong. I must be less than. Mm. That, in a nutshell, is the struggle that everybody has with judgments. And judgments are tragic expressions of unmet need. Either the recipient or the speaker of the judgment. So, in this case, the person, you heard the person say whether they actually did or not. You heard the person by not revealing themselves when you revealed yourself. Uh-oh. You are less than. That's what you're, you're hearing this person, I must be less than because I'm not getting what I want back or what I'm expecting back. Your need for reciprocity wasn't being met. You opened yourself up 
to your own self-judgment as well as the judgment of the other. The other person, the one who's, who didn't reciprocate, was making a judgment about what kind of... Let's just, I mean, have, who knows what this person was judging, right? <laughs> who talks like that? Actually, I've never... I, you know, the statement, I've never known anybody like you before. Is that a statement that uplifts you or denigrates you? I think it depends on the context and maybe what happened if I've acted selfishly and someone says that, then I'm like, oh, there's a moment of pause where, or versus, oh, we're having a conversation and it's enjoyable and it's creative. That could, that could be uplifting or if it's prefaced by some actions that I thought were selfish, then I'd feel it would be denigrating or a yeah. moment of exactly. call to Yeah, to that's pretty normal. Yeah. I think average, that's... A, the, th the thing is, the words are the same words. Yeah. What made the difference was a judgment, either a judgment from the speaker or the judgment from the listener. That Krishnamurti mm. said, to observe without judgment is the highest form of human intelligence, which in itself is a judgment, but it works. I mean, you know, it's, it's a catchy phrase. The point being, how to, to observe, to experience, to engage without judgment and whether it's about intelligence or not, who cares? It is about, if you have no judgment, uh, you're free to respond in whatever way you want. How then would I, how can I then date without internalizing others, the judgment of others or perhaps my reaction to the judgment of others or my own judgment of myself practice <laughs> practice <laughs> so but before you go into practice understand so uh daniel siegel wrote a book called the developing mind what's interesting the second chapter is about emotions the first chapter is about memory and he says in that emotions are rooted in in things that we remember it's an evolutionary Mm, construct in the sense that our emotions don't happen when we experience them. The process of having an emotion comes milliseconds mm -hmm. before. First thing is that um, we, there's a stimulus. Either we hear something, we see something, we feel something. Then the next thing is our unconscious automatically it's survival. Uh, says evaluates this pay attention that's the first thing the second thing and the next millisecond is is this good or is this bad the third millisecond all unconscious before anything that we're aware of is how good is this how bad is this and I can't quite remember the fourth but it's more like okay then the body starts to res to respond in accordance to if this is safe or dangerous very safe, very dangerous, or not. And then you begin to feel the emotions based on the release of neurochemicals. So, your emotions are rooted in your, in your memory. You, you've had this experience before. And for all you know, it could have been an experience or a belief that you go into that dating experience. You take a belief with you. Your anxiety is rooted in an old learning, an old experience that may have happened only once or may have happened repeatedly. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think now as you're, we're having this conversation, it's realizing in that moment of quote unquote rejection that that's proof of our incompatibility, not proof of my unlovability. The reason that rejection hurts is because I think there's a deeper underlying hurt and in that and that in this in this situation it kind of hits to that where yes. i'm like oh there you go rash see i told you right so your child your your little guy yeah is still experiencing the abandonment and in this case it was abandonment by yeah. by your father so the magic bullet <laughs> okay there is one or oh my god <laughs> you know i hesitate saying that <laughs> But the more I practice it, yeah. the more magic it seems to generate. The magic bullet is connecting with that little boy. Yeah. Right? 
Now, and giving that little boy empathy for his trauma. And what is trauma, as was taught to me, is that any experience can be traumatic. What, it, what separates a traumatic experience from a, an event is in the moment where the event takes place, the individual experiences an emotion because, and in this case, a, a, a shocking emotion, and the need, a need was not met. So it could be a need for safety, it could be a need for a community, uh, and what, why it's tra traumatic, because there's no resolution. There's no explanation. It's, there's no, res uh, I said resolution, there's no way of, there's no grieving, there's no means to mm, fill up that hole that was created when the need wasn't met. So, even things that happened um, when we were children, uh, for example, you know, I believed, I believed I needed to be the Renaissance man. I needed mm -hmm. to do everything. To be loved? No, uh, not to be loved, but to be, um, to be acceptable or, mm -hmm. you know, to, no, for safe, then, well, maybe, I never thought accepted by my dad. Yeah. I mean, something like that. It was really weird. Right. Why? Because when I was at some age, I told myself the story. I wanted to help him. He gave me a hammer and nails. He says, okay, you can help me. I need to put, put the nails into this piece of wood. And I couldn't do it fast enough. He says, it's okay, I'll do it. And he did it. And that was it. That event, whether it, whether it happened or not, whether I was playing or really helping him, whether he, he grabbed the hammer or whether he just said, no, okay, thank you, that's very nice. I, but I wasn't completed my job. I don't know. But I thought, well, that's it. I, I'm, oh, I know. I didn't live up to his standards. His, what he, what, he was my idol. Yeah. So the only way I can make up for that is to be, and when I heard about the, learned about the Renaissance, oh, you know, I can sword fight, I can ride horses, I can woo women, I can do everything. That was my goal. Yeah. And as long as I didn't meet that goal, I struggled. Hmm. Until I recognized I don't have that. I said to my little boy, that's not what happened. You're a very competent little boy. You weren't strong enough to hammer the nail the way a 50-year-old man or your, your dad could hammer it. You weren't strong enough. When you get strong, you'll be able to do that. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll be able to do it when you get... I'm going to be able to hand a nail like my dad does? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll believe you. And I had to tell myself that three, four, five. You know, whenever it came up, I just went back to there. Hmm. The first time I discovered about... And are you I'm, imagining you at that age too, visually? Is this a visual? Is there a component of visualization as you're doing this practice of engaging with yeah, the little child? Yeah, I mean, child? you know, I don't see. It's not a hologram, right? But he's sitting right there. I, you know, uh, I usually do the, this kind of work when I'm in the bathtub. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a great conversation with uh, an eight-year-old girl this morning while I was talking to her adult. 50-year-old self, hmm. but whatever it came up, I said, I'd like to talk to your little girl. Hmm. She brought her forth. We had a lovely conversation. Hmm. So, um, and then, but I, my, the, the really strong, I remember my little boy, I was anxious about, I, no matter what I tried to do, I couldn't get harmony between my wife and myself. I got frustrated. Hmm. She says, maybe you should look inside yourself. Great, thank you. So two weeks later, I'm doing this process. I conjure him up, and it's about, you don't have to look after the world, Zalik. You're, you're a child. You're supposed to go out to play. Really? Yeah, you just go out to play. Okay, I'm going out to play. The next three days later or something, I begin a, a, a conflict with my wife, something. He says, don't look at me. I'm going out to play. Yes. 
Because when he drives the bus, I get frustrated. When the little child? And he was always hopping into the driver's seat. Mm. Made it impossible for me to get to where I wanted to go. Was there a need to initially to, to be this renaissance man to, to gain approval romantically or were, by the time you were competency competency right i wasn't competent when i was four years old uh. i was incompetent and i knew i was in, at least i deemed i myself i judged myself to be incompetent and spent the rest of my life trying to prove my competency and if somebody took something away that allowed me to demonstrate how competent I was, I'd get frustrated and annoyed, angry, and yell. Yeah. Which would happen fair. Or I didn't enter into a relationship. So you've been married now for upwards of 20 years? 27 years. 27 years. And I guess uh, to close it off, in those, those 27 years, what, what could you if you were to, to summarize or boil it down to uh, what would one I, thing, yeah, yeah. It's How, what, why, what has kept it going for 27 years? Uh, Jim, I heard an interview with Jimmy Patterson by a, a student from BCIT. This was, it was a boring interview. Yeah. You know, what do you owe your, but the last question was, what do you, bo what do you owe your success to? Yeah. And J Jimmy Patterson said, you got to want to. And both my wife and I want to have what we've always experienced with each other. We want it. And because we want it, we'll do whatever it takes. That's the, other, you know, that's the method that gets you anything you want. The wit method. You know what I mean by that? Whatever it takes. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much, Alec. I appreciate okay, that. Rush. Yeah, right. that was really. I could have asked for a. Well, that's a super. Better. I've never been interviewed before. Yeah, that was a lot of fun.